everything is embers And my heart remembers That you are here with me In the middle of the storm When everything gets scattered My heart will not be shattered But you are here with me Whenever I call Whenever I call out your name Your answer always is the same This truth that comes and it sets me free You are here Here with me In the middle of the battle This song will be my war cry So my heart cannot deny That you are here with me In the middle of the wilderness Surrounded by loneliness When my soul cannot find rest you are here with me Whenever I call out your name Your answer always is the same This truth that comes it sets me free You are here You're here with me your name Your answer always is the same This truth that comes it sets me free You are here sets me free You are here You with me like an open book You write my story and call it good I can't imagine a greater truth Who is like you? You know what I'm thinking before I ask You're in my future, you're in my past It's hard to imagine the way you move Who is like you? And you give my eyes the light 
You give my lips the words to speak You give my lungs the air to breathe You are my everything You give my soul a song to sing You give my heart a melody You give it every single beat For you are my everything Oh Jesus You are my everything Your love is like sand on a thousand shores You give and you give and still there's more Cause I can't imagine the greater truth Oh, it's like you Come on You give my eyes the light to see You give my lips the words to speak You give my lungs the air to breathe You are my everything you give my soul a song to sing You give my heart a melody You give me every single beat You are my everything Oh, you are my everything This is too wonderful It's incomprehensible Don't have to imagine what I would lose Cause I'll never live a day without you This is too wonderful It's incomprehensible Don't have to imagine what I would lose Cause I'll never live a day without you the words to speak You give my lungs the air to breathe Jesus, you are my everything You give my soul a song to sing You give my heart a melody You give it every single beat Jesus, you are my everything Jesus, you are my everything Jesus, you are my everything This is too wonderful Your love is like sand on a thousand shores You give and you give and still there's more Turn over. Everybody doing all right? I was thinking as I was rolling up uh, today, we had that barbecue last week. I was thinking, man, I wish we had another one this week. Is that just me? Am I the only one that thinks like that? I don't think so. Uh, I said to the guys last week, I said, we should do this every week, and they handed me like an apron. It's like, oh, I, I see what you're doing there. Hey, uh, this week we're going to learn a brand new song. It's uh, just a song that's a great reminder that God has been so faithful through all of history and through all of our history, and that everywhere we look, if we're looking, there's evidence of his love and his faithfulness. So I'm going to sing the song or the chorus for you one time, and then maybe we could try it together. It goes like this. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. Can we try that together. 
here I am again Caught up in your splendor You invite me in And so I will surrender You have always been what I was looking for So let me be found Lost in you Lost in you Let my heart rest what is true and what is true let your love reign over everything I say and do let me be found let me be found lost in you Here I am again Surrounded by your glory Oh, the strength I find within Your power to restore me But you have always been my gem Let me be found lost in you, lost in you. Let my heart rest in what is true, in what is true. And let your love reign over everything. Say and do Let me be found Let me be found Lost in you Cause only you Cause only you can satisfy This heart of mine This heart of mine And only you can satisfy me only you can satisfy this heart of mine, this heart of mine. Only you can satisfy me. And only you can satisfy this heart of mine, this heart of mine. Only you can satisfy me. Come on, sing it like you mean it. And only you can satisfy this heart of mine. This heart of mine, and only you can satisfy me. So let me be found lost in you, lost in you. And let my heart rest in what is true. What is true? Let your love reign over everything I say and do. Let me be found. Let me be found. Lost in you. It's only you. Cause only you can satisfy this heart of mine, this heart of mine. Only you can satisfy me. Only you can satisfy.
satisfied This heart of mine, this heart of mine Only you can satisfy One of the things that I've noticed in myself is it's really easy for me to kind of just move to the next thing, uh, especially when the thing that we've just enjoyed, it's like this music, this band is so, so great, but then how much am I letting these words and these ideas sink in? And so as we've sung today and we just leaned into this idea that we go, you know what? We believe that God answers us in, in the ways of, that our hearts need the most. I also imagine that you came into this room with something that it's like, hey, here's this big thing that I'm walking through right now. Uh, maybe the thing that you're walking through is dealing with a relationship that you go, you know what? The thing that I need right now that I'm always thinking about is the way I want this relationship to be repaired or to be renewed. And then you walk in, you go, yep. And then we're gonna sing some songs. Or maybe you walk in and you go, man, I'm in a season of life where everything just feels like I don't know what's next. I'm wandering. I'm trying to figure out the schooling thing. I'm trying to figure out my career. I'm trying to figure out what, what to do in the season of life. Or there's a health thing that you're working through right now. And the idea that I believe God wants us to walk into is that whatever we're working through, he meets us right there in the middle of that. And so today I wanna to invite you to figure out what it is that you feel like, hey, this is the thing that when I'm just kind of uh, uh, sitting up at night and I'm thinking, this is what comes to mind. This is the thing that I really, I really wanna see progress in this area of my life. I really wanna see this, this thing, you know, I want there to be a solution to what I'm working through. So as you identify that, let, let's come to our heavenly father and talk to him about these things. God, we believe that you are a heavenly father who invites us into a relationship where there's intimacy. As we've sung the idea before of, of there's this way to be fully known and fully loved, fully accepted with you. And so we wanna bring the things to you that matter to us, the things that we're longing to see resolution or, or just growth in. And as a community, we want to step into this belief that you are a God who meets us right where we're at, but you provide better solutions that we would ever offer, that we would ever think are available, that you meet us in the way that our hearts long for depth and for hope and for freedom, and you are the best available solution. So help us move towards you in the midst of, of the yearnings, of the brokenness, of the things we're walking through, and remind us that you are the God who is right there with us. And there is evidence of that wherever we turn. So we thank you for this. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, everybody. I wanna welcome you to Terra Nova. How beautiful it is just to be together, to be singing these songs together. I wanna invite you to go ahead and take a seat this morning uh, as we're here. And as you do, if, if you wanna just turn to somebody nearby and say, hey, if you wanna give them a high five, you're welcome to do that as well. I guess you can do whatever you want. And I guess I've lost the room for the next several hours, so that's fine as well too. But man, it is so good just to be here today, a beautiful weekend, like Christian said, maybe, maybe it could have been a barbecue weekend, maybe every week could be a barbecue weekend, but, but we're here together today and that is so good. And so again, I wanna welcome you and thank you for joining us this weekend at Terra Nova. Uh, we're gonna have a great time today as we jump into part two of a series we kicked off last week called Homecoming. And so we got that to look forward to. But, uh, but if you're here and it's one of your first times with us, you're a guest with us here at Terra Nova, we wanna thank you. Man, we know how, how hard it can be to go anywhere for the first time, how awkward that can feel. And so the fact that you're hanging with us this morning means a lot. And I hope that you find your experience just to be a great one here today. And uh, probably as you came in, you got one of these programs handed to you Today. So if you got a program, you can pull this guy out. You're going to see a number of different things that are in there. You might pull out uh, this flyer, uh, a few things on it. But one of the things I wanted to highlight is we've got one of our Terra Nova University What is the Bible seminars that's coming up in just a few weeks. And so if you're wanting to get in play on that, you can read more on that flyer and get signed up for that. You might see a lot more in the program itself. Uh, you might even read about, we've got a young adults lunch happening right after the service today. And there is a ton more that is happening uh, within the Terra Nova community in the weeks to come. And so make sure during our gathering, you spend some time reading through that program and seeing all the stuff that is, that is coming up. Uh, but the place I'd love to invite you to begin with right now is if you open up the program, you look at the very back of it, we've got this section right here that we call our connect card. And so uh, what I'd invite you to do, I invite everybody to do this every single weekend 
weekend is to find that guy and you're going to fold it over. You can tear it out and then you can just fill it out. And uh, as we always say, you could, you could share as much or as little information as you want to share. If you've got some questions or things that you're working through going, I'd like to talk with somebody about this, let us know that. If there's an update on something that's, that's kind of big in your life, we would love to hear that. Or if there's anything we could join you in praying for, please let us know that. And like I said, we'd love to get a Connect card from everybody every single weekend. Uh, and especially if you're a guest with us, it gives us an opportunity just to say thank you, thank you, thank you for being a guest and following up with you. And if you've got any questions or things that you want more information on, uh, you can check those boxes or just let us know that. And so you could spend some time working on that Connect card. And, and as you dive into that, I, I wanted to let you know uh, about another thing you're going to find in that program, uh, which, which is this guy. It's our volunteer menu. And over the last few weeks, we've been talking about this every single week. Uh, and so uh, we've We've been laying out just the ways that a couple times a year, we open up all of our volunteer opportunities to everybody in our community. Uh, they are short-term commitments. Most of these service opportunities are like every other week. And so it's easy to dive in. And we do this because we actually believe that as a church community, like everybody brings something to the table and we are the best possible team we can be when everybody's diving in. So we've talked about that. Uh, we've laid out the ways that it's like, hey, it's easy. There's, there's some starters if you're just kind of brand new or looking for easy ways to jump into it. We've got that. We've got side dishes. We've got things that happen outside of these four walls, kind of our takeout options. We've talked about the ways that like, hey, if you look at the, the house specialties and the main course, uh, we just kind of sweeten the deal. And if you sign up for one of those, you get a t-shirt. So we've laid out all of that over the last few weeks. And we said, hey, we're going to talk about it all month long. But the month is kind of winding down, which means like this is going to be one of the last times you hear us talking about it which means it is great to talk about these things, but it's even better to dive into it, okay? So today, what we're gonna do is, if you don't already have this menu in front of you, uh, grab it from your program, you can take it out. If you don't have a program, you're gonna find it on the Terra Nova app as well. And what we wanna have you do right now is to spend some time going, okay, with this fall season ahead of us, we want Terra Nova to be this community where we are creating great experiences for our guests and everybody who's a part of this community. And so how can I dive into it? And so uh, you might look at some of those starters. You might go, you know what? I want to jump into one of these main course opportunities, but we want to give you some time to really be intentional because it's great to talk about something, but it's even better to jump into it. And so in just a moment, we're going to have some music that's going to play behind us and, uh, and just take some time to be intentional on signing up. And when you find those areas you want to dive into. You'll just uh, make a big old X through that circle. And then on the very back, there's this order form you could fill out. And if you go, you know what? We've talked about it for a few weeks. So I already signed up. That's great. So right now is a really good time to actually, instead of just being like, I'm just going to talk with some people around me, uh, pray for us. Pray for our teams just to be really full as we go into this fall season. And so with that said, uh, I want to give you some time and some space to work through this as we dive in as a team this fall season. And so we'll have some music play right now. All right, so how's everybody doing? <laughs> I, I believe you. This is awesome. Hey, so uh, what I want to do is start off uh, with a question, and it's this. When you were a kid, uh, did you spend any time pretending? Uh, you, you know, it's a very normal form of child play, right? Uh, isn't it? I mean, so, so do you remember, like, who you pretended to be? Uh, I don't. <laughs> because <laughs> it was a long time ago. And so I had to uh, get in touch with uh, my sons. I've got three sons. And I asked him, I said, hey, so do you remember, because it was you know, more recent, what you pretended to be when, when you were a kid? And, and so uh, son number one, first son said, yeah. He said, I pretended to be a Jedi. 
That's what I did. Uh, I found a piece of PVC pipe in the backyard, and I began to battle the empire on the dark side of the forest. And said I spent hours doing that. And then I had another kid, um, so, uh, my, my, my second son, he said, yeah. Um, he said, I pretended I was Harry Potter. Uh, you know, uh, and which was a little bit problematic, you know, being in a pastor's family during that time. <laughs> a little bit rough. We just kind of had to keep that real quiet. And, uh, and, and then my, my third son, my third son, he, he pretended he was this guy. Yeah. Kobe. Yeah, Kobe Bryant. Uh, so because it was, uh, you know, during that time when uh, Kobe was at the peak of his powers. And we had, uh, out in our front yard, uh, we had a basketball hoop, you know, uh, over the garage, driveway, the whole scene. And so my, my son, he says, oh, yeah, he says, it was great because he says every single time, he says, I pretend that I was Kobe, and there was 10 seconds left. We were down by one. The ball was in my hands, and it was five, four, you know, dribbling, looking for the shot, three, two, jacking up the shot, and then the buzzer sounds, it goes to zero, you know, the nets just rip right straight through the, ho the hoop, and then he said, and afterwards, he said, I would hear the uh, thunderous applause of the crowd. <sighs> you know, the crowd, it was incredible. Uh, so, um, so last week, I pretended I was this guy. Uh, this, is, this is John Muir. Uh, and John Muir is the founder of our national park. So if you've ever been to Glacier National Park, Yellowstone National Park, or Yosemite National Park, is that you can thank this guy. Uh, uh, you can thank John Muir. So I pretended I was John Muir, and I pretended I was John Muir walking on his trail uh, because there is a 220-mile uh, trail up in the Sierras called the John Muir Trail. And, uh, and so I, I pretended I was walking on, on the trail, and our objective uh, was to hike 70 miles, but things did not go as planned. Uh, this, this, and that's another story for another day. But, but the story that we want to enter into is a story that uh, we heard last week as we began our series, and Scott shared us with us. It's the story of the prodigal son. Uh, and then you can find it in Luke chapter 15. It was, a, it was a parable that Jesus told about three characters. The younger son, um, who took the money and split to do his own thing, uh, and, and there's the father, the long-suffering father, and, and then there's the older son who was very responsible but also very unhappy that his brother came home to a party instead of a punishment. All right? Now, uh, as we begin our time together, this is what I want us to do because you guys are ready for this. I want us to pretend that we're one of them. Okay? I want us to use our imagination here for just a moment and, and just to see ourselves in their story. And so, so you, you might want to go ahead and, you know, focus in a way. And maybe you even want to close your eyes. And so the first thing that I want you to do is I want you to pretend that you're the younger son. Okay? Kind of get into his skin, if you will. And I want you to think about um, some of the times in your life that you wanted what he wanted. Where you wanted instant gratification. Where, where you wanted the good things of life. Maybe you wanted the rush of wild living. And then... And then can, uh, can you imagine his feelings as he moves through his story, his shame, his desperation, and his homesickness? Can, 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 you, can you picture that? And, and now I want you to imagine that you're the father, okay? Imagine that you're him, and, and can you get in touch with what the father might be feeling in the story, his feelings of loss? his feelings of longing, and then his feelings of unbridled joy. <laughs> Can you believe your eyes as you, as you see this homecoming where your son that you thought was lost has been found? All right, third and last one. I want you to pretend that you're the older son. I want you to imagine that you're him. And I want you to imagine that you're grappling with just just happen and that you're feeling all the unfairness of it all and and you're feeling the hurt and the bitterness as you make the decision to live outside the party all right that's the story and this story is is really one of the longest most detailed stories that jesus ever told but it didn't come out of thin air 
It came out of an interaction with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Now, now, who are these people? Well, I suppose in the societies that you could call these people the elites because um, they were educated. Oftentimes, they were, uh, they were very wealthy. Uh, and even though Rome had them on a short list, is that they were powerful. Uh, these are the people in the society that had influence. They were the influencers in this society. Uh, and to the elites then, Jesus, loving and kind Jesus, reserves his harshest, most blunt, most direct proclamations for them. So, see, Jesus has no problem calling them out, exposing what they're really all about. Like what he says here in Matthew chapter 23, where he says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Now, now you see where he's going with this, don't you? You see where he's going with this. He's, he's trying to tell the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and us is that your life is a cup. Your life is a vessel, it's a, it's a vessel, it's a vessel, it's, it's, it's a cup. And, uh, and, and that often is that we're all caught up in what that cup looks like on the outside. We're, we get caught up in, in the externals and the image, making sure that everything is, is looking good, good to go, while neglecting what's on the inside. Which again and again, the scriptures refer to as our soul. Our soul. We're going to talk about our soul today. And and when, and when we uh, hear the word soul, is what we mean by it is, is it's, it's really who we really are. It's our real self. It's our spiritual self. It's our eternal self. It's, it's that part of us that goes on and on and lives even outside of our body when our body expires. It's our soul. And, and, uh, and again and again, Jesus, and, and as we move through the scriptures, there's this emphasis on what's inside of us, on the real you, the real me, not the image that we try to project. Uh, it's what God cherishes. It's us. It's the deep us. And you know, when it comes to our soul, our soul has longings, and our soul has desires. And, and, and in order to help us uh, get in touch with what those longings and desires are, is I want us to get some help from this guy. This is Ignatius of Loyola. We're going to talk a little bit about him, a little history lesson, all right? I hope that you'll uh, indulge me with this. But let me just begin with his backstory. He, he comes uh, in the 15th century, uh, and uh, he was a Spanish knight, Ignatius was. He was a, he was a military man, and, and we find that in the, in the prime of his life, uh, in the Battle of Pamphiloma, is that uh, he gets uh, taken out by a cannonball. You know, a cannonball just hits him right in the leg and shatters his leg, all right? And his, uh, his compatriots, uh, his fellow soldiers, pull him from the front lines, uh, barely alive, uh, get him uh, to a safe place where he lays in a bed for months, uh, just recovering, trying uh, to recover. And as, as he's laying there, he's probably doing what you and I would do, is that he begins to consider a change of vocation. So, so, so he decides that he's going to kind of hang up the armor, not going to do the night thing anymore, do the battle thing anymore, and he's going to uh, go ahead and then take upon the robe of a monk. And, and, and so that's what he does. Uh, and, uh, and Ignatius uh, then gathers a group around him, a group of people around him, and begins what uh, was known at that time as the Society of Jesus, uh, but then what was later known as the Jesuits. The Jesuits, perhaps you have heard, of the Jesuits. Now, uh, I know about the Jesuits uh, today because I'm a college basketball fan, all right? Uh, and, uh, and the Jesuits started dozens of universities in the United States and also abroad. And for some reason, these Jesuit schools have storied basketball programs. So when you get to March and there's the NCAA playoffs and it's March Madness and you've got the 64 teams, for, I don't know, is it 68 now? Who knows? Uh, but uh, invariably, you will see these teams get a berth in March Madness. They are teams from places like Xavier and Marquette, places like Creighton and Detroit Mercy and St. Peter's and Georgetown and Gonzaga, all Jesuit schools, all just incredible uh, basketball powerhouses. And of course, and of course, 
back in the 15th century, there was no basketball, all right? Had not been invented. So during that time, what Ignatius was becoming famous for was a treatise that he wrote. It was like a manual that he wrote. And, and, uh, and the treatise was called The Spiritual Exercises. The Spiritual Exercises. So, so he wrote this, kind of this mini booklet called The Spiritual Exercises, which is a handbook on the practices of prayer, on the human condition, on God's love, and on the life of Jesus. And it was like a 30-day deal. All right, so the, the, uh, uh, you were supposed to accomplish it uh, during that span of time. And oftentimes people in those days would take retreats, okay? They would leave their homes and they would go to, to some isolated place and that they would go through the spiritual exercises. And in the spiritual exercises, Ignatius, uh, in a genius way, identifies what he calls the three longings of the soul. Let's take a look at those. Security, significance, and acceptance. Okay, guys, this is from 450 years ago, but wouldn't you say it is true today? It's, it's true today. And, and, and so here's what I believe, is that these longings can never be filled by isolation. These longings can never be filled by writing solo. Is that these longings, I believe that God uh, d desires and designs to fulfill these longings and what it's going to take is a family, a family. Now, now as you see these, let, let's go ahead and go a little bit deeper and let's talk a little bit about families. Let's have some questions to them. Uh, these questions, uh, you know, when it comes to security, the question that we're really asking is, am I safe here? Uh, when it comes to significance, we're just wondering, uh, in this context, do I matter? And, and when it comes to acceptance, what we're wondering is, do I belong? Now, I think that family, family at its best, is what God chooses to use to actually satisfy all these longings in a strong family, in a good family. But as you look at these and you think about your own family, are you going, uh-oh, uh-oh, because uh, perhaps uh, one or more of these bubbles up as a pain point for you. Because you see, maybe... Um, you, you were in a family um, where when it comes to security is that your family was not safe. Uh, you know, your, your, your family was this place where, you know, when you came home, see, you didn't know that that family member, whether they were going to be sober or not, just didn't know. And, and so there were a lot of unpredictability in your family, which means um, your family was a place of broken promises. Some of us grew up in a family like that. And you know how hard that is. Uh, but, but then for others of us, um, you know, uh, when it comes to significance is that maybe you were thinking about our family and, you know, you know <laughs> my family, it was a place where you, you never had a meaningful role. You were relegated to the sidelines. You were not a contributor. And maybe you were treated as like more of a nuisance. Other people were more important in your family than you were and everyone knew it. In other words, you were not valued. You, you weren't valued in, in your family. And, and then for others of us, you know, our pain point is acceptance because you were never enough. You were a disappointment. I mean, there was a lot of scorekeeping going on in, in your family, which meant is that when you screwed up, you were not forgiven. You weren't forgiven. So, your family. Uh, are there some pain points? Can you see them? Can you identify them? No. <laughs> If, if things this morning are beginning to feel a little bit dark, <laughs> okay, I, I got some good news from you. Okay, so we got some, we got some good stuff coming, all right? Okay, we're going to plow through this. You're going to be, we're all going to be okay. So there's some good news coming up quickly, but I want to add another layer to this because now that we've addressed our biological family, so let's talk about our spiritual family. Uh, let's talk about this thing that we call the church. Because again, as God, uh, I believe, has this great desire to fulfill the longings of our soul um, through family, it's not, not just our biological family, but I believe in a, in a deeper and greater way is that God wants to do that through what we're doing here, uh, through the church. And for some of us, that <laughs> with the church, uh, it, uh, it gives off a positive charge, and for some of us, it gives off a negative charge. In fact, you know, there are some of you that kind of came walking in here, and maybe you've been here new, or that you're here for a while, and you've been away from church for a long, long time, but you're back. 
Uh, and, and you're hoping that your experience will be different because the first time around is that uh, you've got some church pain that you've walked in with. So some things that happened at church that really like took you for a loop. And, uh, and, and for many of us, that's our story. Uh, that, that, that's our story. It, and, and so with this thing that we call the church and how it connects to our soul and our real us, um, how it is that God wants to use the church to allow our soul to thrive is that we've got to contend with a whole different set of questions when it comes to the church. And when it comes to security is that one of the things that we're wondering when we walk in a church and we're considering being a part of a church, joining a church, is that we, we ask, um, am I safe here, of course, but we really are asking, do people keep their promises here? Is that a thing here? Uh, when it comes to significance, we're asking, uh, is there an important role that I get to play? Uh, and, and when it comes to acceptance is that we're asking, and this might be the most important question, will I be loved despite my differences? That's uh, what, what we're asking. Now, now I think a, a church, I think our church can move to a place where our answers to all these questions will be yes. They'll be Yes. Now, now, I think that we can move to that place as we are fed and fortified and led by the example of the very first church, the very first one, the church at the beginning. And so we're going to go ahead and take a look at that church, uh, and its story is in Acts chapter 2. So if you brought a copy of the scriptures, I'd invite you to turn to Acts chapter 2. Uh, you can go ahead and uh, use that outline that we provided and follow along as well. I also want you to keep this serve menu handy, okay? So we're going to be uh, revisiting that serve menu a little bit. So just cut ahead and keep that close by. So just let me give you some background. Uh, Book of Acts written by um, a, a man named Luke. Um, and at the beginning of Acts is that uh, we have Jesus going home. He ascends into heaven, but he doesn't leave his followers as orphans. Instead is that he promises the Holy Spirit spirit and in the uh in the in acts chapter 2 is that the holy spirit descends um is that uh he uh the holy spirit arrives and fills the people it, they're in jerusalem it's actually a very public thing um there is uh then uh, a moment where uh peter one of jesus followers stands up and begins to speak about jesus and through that is that there's three thousand people that say yes to jesus in one day uh, and then one day, that family that, uh, of, of Jesus uh, goes from maybe 120 people to 3,000 people. And so now, here's what we know about this family. In Acts chapter 2, let's start with verse 42. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles' All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And? <laughs> Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being safe. Okay, now that we've read this, is that what I want to do is break it down for us and, and help us to see what a fully functioning family is and does for our souls, for, for the real us, for, for, for the us that is the one that's deep down inside. And, and you know really what it's all about, what this spiritual family is all about? Notice in the very first uh, uh, verse that we read, it's about being devoted it's about devotion. Uh, and, and then I would say then that it's really all about the commitments that we make to each other. The commitments that we make to, to each other. Uh, and, uh, and it's the uh, commitments that we make to each other to help us become the kind of people who keep our promises and play our important roles and who love people despite their differences. So we make commitments to each other. Uh, in this passage, I see that there are five. There are five commitments um, that we see here, and that these are the ones that we can make to each other. Here's the first one. The first one is a commitment to learning. A commitment to learning. You notice that they devoted themselves to the apostles' uh, teaching. And so, so we want to receive teaching. 
And, and imagine what it was like for them uh, back then, those 3,000 and so people, because uh, many of them had heard the teachings of Jesus. And, and, but now suddenly is that they're hearing teaching uh, from uh, people like Peter or John or maybe Matthew or perhaps Nathaniel or, or Thomas. And, and they devoted themselves as a teaching. Now, why did they do that? Because probably they figured that there was a lot to learn about the way of Jesus. Uh, so see, see, they need to kind of, kind of recalibrate and refigure kind of their whole uh, religious worldview and mindset, which was anchored on 613 commandments of the Old Testament law. And it just all of a sudden just got kind of scrambled. Uh, and, and then they began to get, receive clarity about this new way of living, which was by grace through faith. And, and it was all uh, not about the rules, but really about relationships. And, uh, and, and, was, and, it was about, and it was about healing, and it was about power and transformation. And they just felt like that there was a lot to learn about that. So they devoted themselves to be learners, just like we're doing. See, see we're, we're committing to be learners here. We're committing to be learners on the way of Jesus because we believe that there's much to learn and that we disbelieve that we've got it all figured out and that we know everything about it. Yep, we're passionate, you know, here at Terra Nova about being here week after week and receive teaching because we need to learn and that we're helping ourselves. And you know what else we're, you know who else we're helping is that we're also uh, playing, placing particular focus on helping our next generation on helping our kids, on helping other people's kids, on helping our grandkids if we have them. Some of you do. And, uh, and it's really uh, a beautiful vision that we have of being a learning community where in this room as adults that we are learning, but we're also paying special attention to making sure that our kids become learners too is that they receive teaching. And, and that's where this uh, serve uh, menu again comes in. You spend a little bit of time with that. But I just want to, uh, to uh, again, revisit uh, these house special opportunities that deal with our children and youth and, uh, and, and to challenge you uh, to think about uh, making a six-month commitment and investing in our children and our youth. And you might be going, gosh, man, I don't even know the first thing about teaching. And teaching kids and it might freak you out or scare you. Is that, so here's the thing, is that I have noticed that, uh, that when a person goes and teaches is that they just learn so much and that there's so much grace. And frankly, there's a lot of joy in teaching um, kids as well. And, uh, and this is just something that we're very passionate about and we're really committed to. We're committed to learning. And, uh, and we're committed to learning not for ourselves, but also for a coming generation. And so, so uh, this is a time, again, where we make commitments to each other. And one of the commitments that you might make today is a commitment not only to be a learner yourself, but also to help children be learners. And that would be a very, very powerful thing uh, for you to do. But there's a second commitment that I, want to, want it to, that I see here that I want to talk to you about. And that's the commitment to joyful attachment. A joyful attachment. This place, they were devoted also to the breaking of bread. And later on it says that they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. And so this is where it gets really good because we get to talk about food. All right? So, so, like, food was a thing, okay? And I just love it because, you know what? Eating together was what the original church did. I mean, they did communion as well. That might be part of uh, what uh, Luke was referring to. But, but, uh, but they had meals together. Uh, and, and so here's the thing. Is that you not, might not be a God, Bible, Jesus person, but you know that something, something happens, uh, when you have a dinner party uh, at your house or a barbecue in the backyard or a weenie roast down at the beach, um, it's a bonding thing, isn't it? it? It's a bonding thing. And just with food being, and some drink being present is that it just moves relationships from casual to deep. It can certainly do that. It can certainly do that. And, and so, so when we're talking about food, we're not talking about eating for function or fuel or nutrition, although those are all good things, is that, you know what? We eat to go deep. We eat to go deep with people, uh, deeper with people, deeper with relationships. And you see this all the time, don't you? And, and you see this all the time at Terra Nova. Christian, I mentioned, you know, last week at the barbecue, you know, and, and he got in trouble. They're going to throw, a, you know, an apron on him, you know, and get him to serve next time, you know, which is going to be great. 
but, uh, but, but here's the thing. It's something that we just take really seriously. We're very intentional about it. Uh, and one of the reasons we're intentional about it is because we see the early church doing this. And the other reason is it's just one of these things that is part of the human experience. We all know that sharing a meal together, there's just something that's special that happens when we share a meal together. And uh, it makes us a more connected place. It makes us a more joyful place. There's gladness when those things take place. And so, so we want to be in a place like like that, right? We want to be placed at that in just a couple different ways to play. Again, going back to the serve menu, you'll find during the starters, there's the barbecue team. And uh, I want to challenge uh, a bunch of you to just go, you know what? I want to uh, help in making this place a more uh, joyfully connected place, uh, and I'll do this. And, and we've got this great team. They did a fantastic job last week, and they had a real full roster. Uh, but there are times, because they're uh, being asked upon to do this a lot, not only but barbecues, but also women's breakfast. They'll be doing that, a number of other different things, uh, where uh, they're going to need uh, help. And, uh, and, and, and you don't even need to know how to cook. Uh, you can just be involved um, and, uh, and just sign up and they will help you and you'll be glad that you did six month commitment. And uh, if we get a whole ton of people, that means that we get to do a whole ton of them, okay? <laughs> if we get a few people, then we're not going to do many of them, all right? So it's up to us and it's going to be fun. And uh, uh, you look at an apron, you're going to look fine. Uh, so just want to encourage you uh, to, to do that uh, and to just to make this a place of loving attachment. All right, a third commitment. A third commitment that we see here is to God's supernatural workings. God's supernatural workings. And we see this here in verse 42, where it says that they were committed not only to the breaking of bread, but they were committed to prayer. Um, they were committed to prayer. They were devoted to prayer. Prayer was a big thing. And I, and, I, and I think about this act of praying, you know, about what it is. I mean, you know, when we pray, it, we're believing that God hears us and acts when we pray. We believe that prayer makes a difference. We believe that prayer changes things. We believe that prayer gets a lot done. We believe that prayer heals. We believe that it's supernatural, you know, because God's out there and, and that we get to seek him. And of course, God doesn't want to be treated as like some sort of like holy vending machine, you know, where we, you know, pop in a couple of prayers, and, you know, we get a bag of Lay's potato chips that drop down, you know, at the bottom. You know, that's not how uh, we want to engage God, but we want to engage God um, in a way Way where we're really believing is that our prayers can impact the world that is beyond us, this, you know, beyond our three-dimensional world. And we believe that. And you know what? Some people think that's weird. And some people think that prayer is just wishful thinking, and I get it. But we believe that God exists beyond our three-dimensional world and that God can do things beyond, that he can perform wonders and signs just in the same way that he performed wonders and signs through the apostles back in the book of Acts. And so, and so we're committed here at Terra Nova, not just to, to learning, but to leaning into times where we pray. And, uh, and Scott had talked to us uh, uh, here briefly about the connect card and that's actually one of the ways that many many of you um, get a chance to uh, to just engage in prayers of communities you write down prayer requests and that we have a prayer team that's very serious about praying for that request we actually have a prayer team that just launched last friday a prayer time uh, friday afternoon here in the hub um, that they are beginning and so we're taking some steps in being a, a community that that believes in god's supernatural uh, workings because i mean that's what prayer is you know, prayer is just this idea that God's going to move and he's going to do some things that we just couldn't do and, uh, and that we're really focused on that. Now, I know that for some of us is that sometimes we're uh, uh, really at a loss of exactly what to pray for. Um, oftentimes, you know, we, we're just not really quite sure. Uh, but I uh, believe that if you take a look at the book of Acts is that you'll find that there's this thread that runs through that, that with the early followers of Jesus, that there are some things that they prayed about often and that maybe we should pray about those things as well. Basically, three things that I say is that they pray for spiritual power, they pray for God's leading, and they prayed for open opportunities. Spiritual power, God's leading, open opportunities, they prayed for those things. Spiritual power is that they wanted to have a strength that was beyond themselves. Uh, God's leading, they didn't want to do anything that was not God-directed. And then when it came to open opportunities is that they prayed uh, for open opportunities to tell the good news of Jesus and invite people to come home to God's family. And they did that starting in Jerusalem and then going to Judea and Samaria and they went to the entire world. That's what they were committed to. They made this commitment to each other. Here's the fourth commitment. The fourth commitment is generosity. Generosity is that they gave 
They gave. They were together. They had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give anyone who had need. They were able to take some of, of, of their resources, liquidate them, turn them into money, and, uh, and, and, uh, and deliver that to people um, that had needs. They were devoted, it says to Scripture, to a fellowship, which means a shared life. And this is an illustration of what a shared life looks like. Now, a shared life is not uh, you know, having a donut and a cup of coffee in the lobby um, after the service. It's a good thing, but fellowship shared life goes much deeper than that. Uh, shared life means that you're in the trenches with people. Is that you're really helping them out, that you're sacrificing time and energy. And so, and so that's what they did. They got excited about this. And if you've been around uh, Terra Nova, is that you know that we're really excited about this. Excited about how our collective generosity changes the world, about how it is that, that we're able to pull together and give sacrificial to just to, to do so much good and to make so much impact uh, in the world. And it's just one of the things that I just love, love, love about Terra Nova, the commitment that we have together to be generous here's the last one the last one is that they had a commitment to showing up (laughs) they showed up in the temple courts and they also showed up in their homes okay you know two venues and notice the frequency here it is every day Every day, every day, every day. Now, now this might actually be a little hyperbolic. I mean, we're not really sure, but, but at least you can kind of give it this much is that you know that to them is that they were together a bunch. They were together a whole a lot. Now, now this is where, where, where you might be thinking, well, of course, you know, they had to get together because this is all pre-digital, you know? I mean, they didn't have cell phones and they didn't have Zoom and they didn't have uh, YouTube or anything like that. And so this is kind of like what they were left with. And so here's the thing. It's been a crazy four years since 2020 when we had the pandemic. And, uh, and you know that as a church, some of you have been around us that we use things like Zoom to do life groups and that we've got a YouTube channel now so that people can kind of see what we're doing. For a while, we were doing Facebook Live. It's great for people that are traveling. And some people uh, enjoy turnover that actually live out of the area. But here's the thing is that we all know, we, we know this after four years of doing this, is that uh, let's all agree on this, is that it's just better when we're face-to-face in person. It just is. That's just what it is. And, and, uh, and, and so we just need to come to terms with that. And of course, we also need to come to terms with the question. The question is like, why? Why, why should I? And that's the kid question, right? Some of you have kids and maybe, you know, this morning might have even been a time where you got them in the car and you're driving there and they're not really happy that they're going, you know, and they're just kind of confused and a little bit twisted. Maybe they're eight, nine, 10 years old. And so, you know, they ask the question, why? Because kids, you know, are unpretentious. And they say, so like, why are we even going, you know? And you're like driving, you're like, ah, I'm not even sure. You know, I don't know. It's just a thing we do. Uh, so here's some re- Here's some answers that I think that you can give. You know, you can tell your kids, hey, you know what? We're going because we have a commitment to learn. We are going because we are devoted to a group of people and that God feeds our souls through that. We are going to share life, to do shared life. We are going to give and also to receive. We are going to express thanks to God for how good he has been to us this week. That's why we're going. That's why we're gathering. We're showing up. We've got a commitment to showing up to make this place a home for people so that people can have a homecoming each and every time we meet. And what we're doing then is just merely a reflection of what they did from the beginning. The original church, the first church, the church in Jerusalem. And, and with this church, with this family of over 3,000 newly formed, look at the result. Look what happened. They were praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. I mean, people went, wow. They, they just, you know, they had favor here with the people, with the outsiders. Now, now it meant perhaps that, that there was respect that they had and, and maybe people were taking a look at what they were doing. It's like, I don't know about them, but whoa. I'm not sure I want to be part of them, but gosh, look at how they love each other. Look at how committed they are to each other. Look at the way that they live. And you see, people heard that there was a family, a spiritual family. A homecoming was taking place where everyone was invited. And people began to respond and say yes to that invitation. And we know this is true because, because there's lots of research about this. Uh, John and myself uh, have an a, a author that we like. His name is Dr. Rodney Stark. He's a sociologist, a professor at Baylor. And he estimated that, that some 60 years after this happened, 
in Acts chapter 2, there were in the world about 25,000 Christians, but by the end of the time Emperor Constantine granted legal protection to Christians, the movement had grown to 20 million, okay? 25,000 to 20 million in 200 years, which was amazing, which is amazing, especially when you consider is that they were extending this homecoming to person and a person, everyone they encountered, in a period where Christianity was an illegal religion, in a period where there was no church buildings to meet in, in a period where there were no advertising and marketing strategies, and in a period where they didn't even have the Bible as we know it. So how'd this happen? Well, I think it happened because this family knew two things. Is that First of all, is that they knew something about how God meets the longings and desires of our hearts. You, you, you see, and, and that God does that through his body. You see, when it comes to security, when it comes to security, so they knew something about that. In Psalm 27, verse 5, they knew that from the day of trouble, God, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon the rock. Uh, they, they also knew something about when it came to significance about uh, what it, we read in Ephesians 2.10 where it says we are God's workmanship or his handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God had prepared in advance for us to do. They're saying, oh yeah, you know what? When it comes to you, you've got a purpose and you've got a destiny. And when it comes to acceptance and belonging, the Lord has appeared to us in the past. Jeremiah 31.3 says, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. So they knew this. They knew that God was there to meet the longings and the desires of their soul and that he was going to use it through this thing that we call the church, his body. They knew that. And they also knew something about commitments, about devotion, about how uh, by the grace of God is that we make commitments and we keep commitments. And and that was their story. And and now we're invited to find ourselves in their story once again. And, And so... So we're gonna seek God for that as we pray here in just a moment. But before we do that, is that I want you to turn to a person and I'm gonna uh, have you repeat after me. I'm gonna want you to say to a person next to you, okay, some words that I think that, that people in the early church would say to each other, okay? It's gonna be really simple, right? Ready, repeat after me. Look to a person next to you and say, I need you. And you need me. Let's try it again. I need you. And you need me. You see, that's what friends say. And that's what teammates say. And this is what family says. And now we're ready to pray together. Will you bow with me as we pray? Lord, I just pray, God, that you would, uh, Lord, just form us into this beautiful family where we are devoted to you and to each other. And so, Lord, we pray that you would just give us the grace, the grace, the grace that we need, God, to to see that through, Lord. We uh, just want to ask you to help us fulfill the commitments that we make Lord, that we'd be courageous in it, Lord, that we would see you show up in our lives, God, as we show up for each other. And Lord, we just pray that you would just make our church, this church, a beautiful place, God, and and that it would be a place of homecoming for so many people, a place where so many people can call home, and that is our mission, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.